it. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for the invitation to speak. I'm, I'm really excited to be able to participate, uh, albeit remotely. I'm glad that that worked out. Um, less glad that it had to work out, kind of wishing that the coronavirus were better under control, uh, especially here in the US, but uh, yeah. Uh, since I'm given the last talk, I, I get to, to also say, uh, I think we should thank the organizers. I mean, the, they've done a wonderful job taking an, an in-person conference and very quickly turning it into a great online conference. So uh, please join me, I guess, somehow. Yeah, thank you, Ian. And great job, guys, this is seriously fantastic. And I know it was a lot of work, so thank you very much. Okay, so as I said, um, I'm, I'm gonna talk about techniques of computation in equivariant and uh, and then some in motivic comatopy um, trying to hit on as many of the key words from the title of the conference as possible um, i'm i'm aiming this to be more introductory than sort of the research side and please do if you have questions uh, ask away and i'll try to answer them as we go through um, most of my focus in the talk is going to be on the equivariant computations. A lot of them for, um, for everyone's maybe second favorite group, the group with two elements. And the reason I'm going to be focusing on this one is, is uh, well, several fold. First, the group with two elements, which I'll call C2 from now on, is the Galois group of the complex numbers over the reals. This ties it to a lot of geometric and algebraic geometric concepts. Namely, if I wanna talk about say, descent for real vector bundles, it's the same thing as understanding a complex vector bundle together with this descent data of a C2 action. Second, a lot of classical and chromatic computations can be seen in this C2 equivariant story. And actually, I know that, that you all saw uh, Dan Isaacson's series of talks earlier in the conference where he talked a lot about the connections between uh, motivic over R, motivic over C, C2 equivariant homotopy, and, and classical homotopy. So I'll pick up on some of those themes as well. And then finally, and this one really I should have led with, because in some ways it's the most important from my perspective, uh, we can actually do computations here. A lot of the literature about equivariant homotopy theory tends to suggest that computations are essentially impossible. Um, some of which go so far as to say, it's impossible to do some of these. Um, I, I don't find that to be the case. And I hope that by the end of my talk, uh, you agree that a lot of these computations are much more doable uh, than you may have thought initially. Okay, so I'm going to start by just saying uh, that we're going to be working in the following context. Uh, there we go, lost my bit of spell. I'm going to be working for, uh, uh, working in uh, what people sometimes call genuine, uh, equivariant homotopy. Now, um, I, I hate the word genuine here. It's for two reasons. It's very value laden, uh, especially when you compare it to the, the contrast. We will talk about naive equivariant or genuine equivariant. There's a, a distinct hierarchy established there and it's not actually supported in the math. So what I would advocate for, and uh, I hope I can start to get traction in this, is not to call this genuine, but rather to call it something instead like complete. And the complete here means that we have all transfers. And this is a theme that I'm gonna spend uh, a little bit of time talking about as we go forward. 
But before I do that, uh, I'm actually going to start with just uh, a little bit of a review. So how do we talk about uh, uh, computations and where do the invariants live? So how do we uh, understand uh, how do we understand uh, homotopy groups? Uh, 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 G spectra and G spaces. And Dan also talked Maybe, about... So, sorry, there, there is a comment by Yuri Sulima. Uh, he yeah. says that one version of naive G, G spectra is often called Borel complete. And they say. Yeah, that's true. Uh, I don't understand the frowny face there, Yuri. Um, it, it is the case that that the homotopically meaningful version of naive G spectra is the is Borel spectra. And here uh, we don't necessarily have transfers. These are things where we sort of free up the action historically. Um, and I guess the not having transfers is is probably why you had the frowny face. So I'm with you on that one. Um, so in the equivariant context, the first thing that I run into is I can't get away from thinking about homotopy sheaves instead of homotopy groups. And of course, the real way we should be doing algebraic topology and sort of the, this ideal world where we have complete control over everything is I would be able to just immediately tell you what maps out of any, say, finite CW complex were. Um, I, I'd love to be able to tell you what maps out of any finite CW complex are. We approximate this instead by restricting attention to maps out of the building blocks of finite CW complexes, namely spheres. I'm gonna do the same thing for, uh, for G spaces or G spectra. So we'll consider, we'll look at, at the functors. And these are functors from the category, uh, which I'll call thin G op into say abelian groups. And this fin G op, this is the category of finite G sets and equivariant maps. And I'm gonna do this just via uh, the Yoneda lemma. And so the ones I'm gonna care about are, I'm gonna take equivariant homotopy classes of maps from, oops, I'm describing a functor, from T plus, so T together with the disjoint base point, smashed with the N sphere into some fixed G spectrum E. And my superscript G here is just reminding myself that I'm taking the, the collection of equivariant maps. Uh, this, is, this is a contravariant functor as written because I'm mapping out of the T plus slot. And so in particular, it fits into this form. And this is sometimes called the homotopy coefficient system. Already, I'm suggesting a way that I should be thinking about my GCW complexes. The CW complexes I'm gonna build, not just out of spheres with a trivial action, but rather out of spheres, again, with a trivial action, but I allow myself to to take disjoint unions of these and to permute the copies of the spheres in those stacks. And that's how the group is going to be acting. So I can map out of this, and this amounts to picking out maps from spheres into various fixed points. So the first thing to notice is that if I have a disjoint union of things, so T disjoint union T prime, and then I take the uh, a disjoint base point and smash this with the n sphere, map this into E, then the inclusions of T and T prime into the disjoint union give me 
a pair of maps uh, backwards. And so I get a decomposition, oops, like this. So in other words, my functor from finite G sets op into abelian groups isn't any old functor. It's one that takes the disjoint union, which is the co-product in finite G sets, which makes it the product in finite G sets op to the product in abelian groups. So in other words, this construction gives me a product preserving functor. And I wanna stress here that I'm in the algebraic context. So saying that I'm a product preserving functor is a property of the functor rather than additional structure. Well, any G set has an orbit decomposition. So this functor, um, slot plus smash SN into E is determined by uh, the values on orbits, by which I mean uh, transitive G sets. So G mod H as H varies over the subgroups. And if you haven't seen this before, then I would suggest that you spend a little bit of time thinking about what, what's the geometric content of maps out of G mod H, equivariant maps out of G mod H into some G space. And you can start to see the interplay between fixed points for various subgroups and then G itself. Okay, now this is the kind of thing that I didn't need to be working in G spectra yet. I could have made sense of this in G spaces, uh, provided N was at least two. And if I'm in G spectra, any kind of G spectra, be it the Borel ones that Yuri brought up, be it the complete ones that I'll be working in, or anything in between, I still have these homotopy coefficient systems. The key feature of the, this complete equivariant homotopy is that I have not only these contravariant restriction maps, but also the covariant transfer maps. So I'm going to define a category, uh, the Burnside category. of G has objects finite G sets. And the morphisms, so HOM in the Burnside category from S to T is going to be, um, well, I'll be a little glib here and just put parenthetically the group completion. of the set of correspondences, S and T. So here I have two equivariant maps, F and G, and then I'm doing this up to isomorphism. So again, I'm, doing, I'm gonna be working in an algebraic context. So I'm working up to isomorphism as, as you know from Clark's work or Angelica's, then I could have instead considered an enrichment of this, be it one where I have a, a two category, and instead of considering this up to isomorphism, I remember the isomorphisms as the two categorical part of the data, or an infinity category where I build much larger diagrams, again, recording uh, isomorphisms and various pullback conditions. Oh, and I should say, uh, if I'm going to say that I have a category, I need to say what the composition law is. And composition is via pullback. So given two uh, correspondences, then I can pull them back and I get another correspondence. 
Okay, so uh, in this category, since the category is the same as that category of, uh, excuse me, the objects are the same as the category of finite G sets, I can still talk about things like disjoint union and Cartesian product. In this category though, um, well, the Burnside category, it's canonically self-dual. And by canonically, I mean, it's the identity on objects. And then I just observe that I have my correspondence, which has, you know, that maps in two different directions. And that's just an, sort of an artifact of the way I'm writing. I'm choosing to read from left to right because it's, that's the only way I know how to read English. But I could have instead swapped it and gone from right to left. Then I would be seeing instead hom from, uh, as written right here, that would be the same thing as hom from T to S. So A is, oh, I should have given this a name. Sorry, script A. So A is uh, canonically self-dual. And the disjoint union is now both the product and the coproduct. And if you haven't spent any time working with this category, or sort of thinking through what this might look like, I would suggest seeing for yourself how the disjoint union could possibly be the product. In other words, see how do I write down maps in the Burnside category from T disjoint union T prime back to T and back to T prime. Whereas in general, I'm not going to have those maps just in finite G sets. So the, the players in the equivariant context in this complete one are Mackey functors. And these are, so a Mackey functor. is a, again, product preserving. Functor from the Burnside category into abelian groups. And I'm always going to indicate my Mackey functors with an underline so that there'll be a little bit of, of type checking to contrast these with abelian groups. Again, any G set can be decomposed into orbits. And if I use that orbit decomposition, I get that a Mackey functor is determined by a much smaller amount of data. So let me spell that out. For G is CP. And I'm going to name a generator CP. So choose a generator to be, say, uh, gamma. Okay. A CP Mackey functor is the following data. I have first an abelian group uh, M of G mod G, which is a point. Second, I have a CP module, M of CP. And third, I have maps, uh, a restriction, which goes from M of a point to M of CP and a transfer M of CP to M of a point. And I'll often write this as a little diagram that, uh, that people call a Lewis diagram after Gaunt's Lewis. My restriction goes like this and my transfer goes up. And then I have an action of my group CP on the, on the CP module. 
And then these satisfy uh, a few axioms. So first, the restriction, uh, the restriction lands in the CP fixed points. And the transfer factors through the covariance. And then second, I have a condition uh, called the Mackey double coset formula, which says that the composite of the restriction with the transfer is the sum over the elements of the group. Which is sometimes called the trace, uh, if you use the Galois theory names. Okay, so uh, that's it. And how am I supposed to connect these to correspondences? So how am I supposed to see this as something coming from the Burnside category? Well, remember that I have in the Burnside category, I have, uh, or excuse me, in the category of finite CP sets, I have a map CP to a point. That's just the crush everything map. And I have a map from CP to itself that's multiplication by gamma. And this gives me a little commutative diagram because point is terminal. Now, when I think the category of finite G sets, I can embed that covariantly as the forward direction map in the Burnside category, or I can embed it contravariantly as the backwards map in the Burnside category. And if I embed it contravariantly, that gave me my restriction map, this one. And if I embed it covariantly, that gave me the transfer map. So both of these two maps here, the restriction and the transfer, arose from this quotient map, from CP to a point. And then the first conditions, this one about the image of the restriction landing in the fixed points, or the transfer factoring through the orbits, are exactly summed up in the commutativity of this little triangle. So it's, it's actually just the functoriality condition. And finally, this Mackey double coset condition, this is what you see if you pull back CP over a point with CP over a point, then the pullback is CP cross CP. And then I wanna write that in terms of, of CP sets. So I wanna break it up into its orbit decomposition. And when you do that, you get exactly this condition. Okay, let me make it a little more concrete because I will actually uh, do a couple of computations later and I wanna be able to, to use these. So uh, there's, the, there's the representable functor, the Burnside Mackey functor. The value at a point is given by Z direct sum Z. And the value at CP is Z. And then the restriction and transfer maps. Um, I'll just write them as little uh, as little matrices. This one sends the first thing uh, to one and the second to P, and the second is zero, one. The vial action here is just via the identity. So as I said, this is actually the the functor I get by mapping out of a point in the Burnside category. Again, this is product preserving because uh, disjoint union was the product. And so it's, it's, the, it's literally the universal property of the product to say that HOM out of a point is product preserving. Okay, um, if you've also seen the Burnside ring, the Burnside ring is the Grotendieck group of finite G sets. So I should also be able to connect these two summands to finite G sets. And I can. This summand is the G set point and the disjoint union of 
copies of point. This one is the G set CP as a CP set. And every CP set breaks up into a different union of points and CP. And then my restriction map is just forget the CP action and just remember the set. And that takes point to a set with one element, and it takes CP to a set with P elements, and that was this map. Okay, so the other that I want is the constant Mackie functor Z. And this one is the value at point is Z. The value at the at CP is also Z. The Restriction map is the identity. The vial group, oops, sorry. Vial group action is also the identity. And then that forces the transfer to be multiplication by P. Because since the restriction is injective, then I can compute the transfer by computing the composite of the restriction with the transfer. And I see I have no choice here. Um, the these two Mackie functors are pretty closely connected. The target is what's sometimes called a cohomological Mackie functor. Now at this point, I should pause and connect this uh, already to what we see in the motivic story. Often when we talk about presheaves with transfers in motivic homotopy, we're referring to things like this that are close to cohomologic Mackie functors. And there I see the same kind of condition that the composite of the transfer and the restriction is multiplication by the index of the group. And that's the condition that I'm writing down here. In equivariant homotopy, we allow these more general kinds of transfers, which you should think of as actually also showing up in the motivic context. This is analogous to the transfer along, say, a, a, a finite et al map. Okay, so before I continue, questions about this so far? I know a lot of this is review, but that doesn't mean that questions won't have come up. You said you said A and the line is a is a Bernstein Mackie from Kern from Tom? Yes. That's the name? Yes. Okay. And it's the usual thing in math where proper names become uh, become adjectives, and so you end up with long strings. Um, so uh, Sean asks, why cohomological? Is this an important distinction? Um, these do these do show up a lot, and and they're the kinds of of Mackie functors that you see with group cohomology, and that's that's one of the reasons why I might. Uh, describe them that way. So from that perspective, they, they, it is a very natural class of Mackie functors that arises. And so there's been a lot of work in this. For us, um, the, the constant Mackie functor Z is a fairly easy one to do computations with, as I'll, as I'll show you in just a minute. And it also arises naturally in the equivariant uh, context. Um, yes, group cohomology does take values in these. Group cohomology naturally has an extension to a Mackie functor. And when I do group cohomology, I consider it in, in one of these contexts. And they're always coming from modules. It's always something that's a module over the constant Mackie functor Z. Uh, no, thanks for asking. Okay. So uh, the reason that we talk about Mackie functors in equivariant homotopy is that uh, Mackie functors play the role of abelian groups. So 
in uh, in genuine G spectra. In other words, all of our usual algebraic invariants are actually uh, Mackey functor valued. So for example, normally I might talk about homotopy groups of a spectrum. And in the equivariant context, I have the homotopy Mackey functors of an equivariant spectrum. I can talk about the uh, a generalized cohomology theory's value on a space or spectrum. And in the equivariant context, I have a Mackey functor worth of the cohomology of x in some E theory. So I have a richer structure that I could be working with. Uh, for those who might uh, worry or wonder about such things, the, the category of Mackey functors is an abelian category. We have enough projectives and injectives so we can do homological algebra the way we normally would. And then uh, in a little bit, I'll also talk about how the category of Mackey functors has a symmetric monoidal product. And so we, we're really exactly like with abelian groups as reflecting what we saw in spectra, we build a model in DG abelian groups. In, we can do the same thing in equivariant spectra. We take equivariant spectra and we compare it to, to DG Mackey functors or DGAs in Mackey functors. So one of the things that I want to be able to do is talk about ordinary homology. And I find it easier when I'm talking about ordinary, ordinary homology to just show you how to compute this in some examples. So uh, how do we compute homology? Now remember, this is supposed to be a Mackey functor, but I'll just tell you the value of this at at some point with coefficients in something. And now just for simplicity for myself, I'll start uh, at this point, switching to the group being C2. So I, had, I, had I planned, uh, I had to use some of the newer technology. I would ask via a poll, what's your favorite way to compute ordinary homology? Um, you know, it's like we would do in a calculus class, do like a, a quick spot check. Um, but if I were to do that, I would guess, I would guess you would say cellular as opposed to singular. Although singular is certainly nice for sort of uh, formal reasons. Yeah, thank you. And yeah, cellular is the way that we actually can compute things easily. We write down a small chain complex to do it. So let's do that here. And let's start with an example. So uh, we'll just do this via cellular homology. And my example is going to be, let's look at, at a representation sphere. So I'm going to take S to the C, by which I mean the one-point compactification of C. And then C, remember I said earlier, uh, my C2 is also the Galois group of C over R. And so this, this naturally has an action of C2 as the, as the Galois action. So if I were to, to draw this, well, this is, the, this is the Riemann sphere. So I have the real line sitting inside the Riemann sphere, and then I have uh, the two hemispheres. And here was my uh, S to the R sitting as the equator, and S to the R, well, this is just S1. And when I think of the two hemispheres in my Riemann sphere, well, I could put them in as 
as showing up. And actually, I'm doing a different projection than you're probably uh, thinking of. I'm going to have the positive complex part being the upper hemisphere, excuse me, the, the positive imaginary part being the upper hemisphere, and the negative imaginary part being the lower hemisphere. So my group acts by swapping the two hemispheres and leaving the equator fixed. So I can build this as an equivariant cell complex. I have two copies of the one sphere, and they're swapped. So I'm going to have a C2 cross S1, because that's two copies of the one sphere. I'll draw a cartoon as I go through. That's my one sphere and my one sphere. And they should have been the same. Um, and the group acts by swapping them. So this is C2 cross it. And I'm going to map this to the one sphere, where I just fold them down. So it's via the identity. It's a, a twisted version of the fold map. And then I can include these into the corresponding C2 cross disks. And that amounts to just putting in a little disk on each of these. And when I pushed this out, so actually let me, let me do it this way. Oops, too much. When I push this out, now I've exactly built my Riemann sphere with the two hemispheres that are swapped. So here's my cell structure. And if I want to take the cellular homology, well, what I need to do is figure out what am I supposed to do when I evaluate what's the homology of one of these G mod H cross a sphere or G mod H plus smash a sphere. So the building block is I'm going to take the homology HN of, uh, whoops, I'll say H star of G mod H cross an n sphere with coefficients in some Mackey functor m. Well, this is going to be, uh, I'll do reduced. This is zero if star is not n, and it's just evaluate m at g mod h if star equals n. Now I can start to write down what, what my homology is going to look like. Notice that this map here, this one, this is the same thing as C2 to a point crossed with the one sphere. And remember, my Mackey functors are exactly built so that they know what I'm supposed to do to maps between orbits. So a map C2 to a point, this is something that I can evaluate my Mackey functor on. Now I can write down the chain complex using that. So in degree zero, again, I'm doing the reduced theory. I have nothing. Excuse me, degree. In degree one, well, I had my one cell. There's only one one cell, and it's the one sphere. So I have M of a point. And in degree two, I had a single equivariant two cell. It was the one coming from M of C2. And the cellular boundary map is just M of C2 going to a point. So notice this is the covariant version of this. So this is the transfer from M of C2 to M of a point. And this tells me how I can write down the, this homology for any of these. So I get H1, 
is the co-kernel of the transfer. And H2 is the kernel of the transfer. And with a little more work, you can get the these as instead Mackie valued things. It amounts to thinking about G mod H and, and putting in another slot where I crossed with some fixed T. Okay, um, so since the this is a talk in the broader context of a summer school, maybe I'll say as an exercise for you. Oops. As an exercise, uh, figure out the homology groups of S K times C with coefficients in any Mackie functor M uh, for all K and M. You can use the same idea that I talked about here. Uh, you'll have to think a little bit about what happens in the cohomology version. So namely when K is negative, but it's, a, it's fun to, to work through. Okay, there's one other thing that I want to point out here. And that's actually right here. I am gonna give a name to this map from S1 into this C sphere. I'm gonna call this A sub sigma. I'm gonna call this sometimes the Euler class. of the sign representation. And if I'm being super pedantic, I'd actually call this the suspension of A sigma, because A sigma is a map from the zero sphere into, now instead, it's just the one point compactification of the imaginary axis in C, where that's swapped, because well, we know how complex conjugation works. And here I'm seeing this cofiber sequence. C2 goes to the zero sphere, or C2 plus goes to the zero sphere, and the cofiber is this sine sphere. And this whole part that I'm writing down in this case is the suspension of that cofiber sequence. So it's something to keep in mind. All right, so I, I brought this up because just doing these computations, understanding the cohomology of these spheres, the K times C spheres as K varies, allows you to get uh, a lot of mileage equivariantly. So I'll start with a theorem. And this is due to lots of people uh, individually. I'm gonna, I'm gonna say that the first parts of this is due to Duggar. Uh, it's due to Hukrish. And it's due to um, me, Hopkins, and Ravenel. And that is that there's a filtration on the C2 spectrum of real boardism, so MUR. Or again, if you're coming from the motivic context, uh, you should think of this as MGL, and then the theorem is due to different people. So motiv motivically, it's due to um, Hopkins and Morel and uh, Hoiwa. And there's a filtration on MUR. Dang with associated graded uh, GER of MUR is, I'll just write it as the eilenberg maclean spectrum associated to that constant Mackey functor Z. And then I'm putting in a bunch of formal indeterminates, where the degree of each of these indeterminates is just like in 
in uh, Dan's talks, my indeterminates are going to be graded by representations, or in this case, they're by graded. Actually, I have two irreducible representations, and this is just uh, I times C, where again, I'm using the complex conjugation action on C. What this means is if I want to compute the MUR homology or MUR cohomology of some space or spectrum, then I have a spectral sequence. And the E2 term is given by, well, uh, say the homology, but I'll write it this way. I'm going to do the homotopy, again, homotopy Mackey functors of the function spectrum from, say, x into hz adjoin these indeterminates. Well, this is just the homology. Uh, oops. Sorry, the negative cohomology of x with coefficients in z. And then I adjoin a bunch of indeterminates. And this spectral sequence converges to the mu r cohomology of x. So it's like an Atiyah Hirzebrook spectral sequence, uh, but I'm using this different filtration. And the filtration is the slice filtration named after the motivic slice filtration of Wojvodsky that uh, was, was done by Duggar initially. Okay, so what I wanna focus on, and uh, I'm seeing that time quickly passes. So what I wanna focus on is that this is a spectral sequence of Mackey functors. So this is sort of the, the first order approximation to understanding the way I can do equivariant computations. Mackey functors form an abelian category, which means I can talk about spectral sequences of Mackey functors. And in this case, what does that mean? We have two spectral sequences. There's the fixed points. So the value at a point. And there's the underlying. And then they're connected. I have a map of spectral sequences that's reflecting my restriction map from the fixed points to the underlying. And I have a map of spectral sequences from the underlying back to the fixed points. And the underlying was actually a spectral sequence of C2 modules. So I have all of this added structure that comes in. It's, not, it's a lot of added structure, but it's not an insurmountable amount of added structure. The biggest thing I can do is I can use the fact that since these are maps of spectral sequences, if I have a class that's a cycle or maybe a permanent cycle, then the image of that under any map of spectral sequences is a cycle or a permanent cycle. If I have a class that's the target of a differential, then I know that under a map of spectral sequences, it's still the target of a differential. So I get a lot of additional uh, constraints on this. So as, a, as just an example, um, in, the, in the spectral sequence computing the homotopy Mackey functors of MUR, the ideal generated by two uh, is an ideal of permanent cycles. And so why? It's just because uh, two times any class X, well remember, I'm looking at something where I started with the constant Mackey functor uh, Z, and in the constant Mackey functor Z, two was 
uh, was the transfer of one in the underlying. And then I have this uh, Frobenius reciprocity condition. Let's me move the X inside. So this is the transfer of one times the restriction of X. So this is the transfer of the restriction of X. And in the underlying spectral sequence, the underlying spectral sequence is just the ordinary Atiyah Hirzebrook spectral sequence, computing the homotopy of MU uh, out of the homotopy of MU. So it, it collapses with no extensions. And the restriction here is a permanent cycle. Oops, it's not how you spell always. So that's giving me a, a huge amount of information about the structure of the spectral sequence that I don't know how I would have known otherwise. I needed that this, this large number of classes, namely twice anything, could actually be written uh, via the Mackey structure as, as a permanent cycle. Okay, so in the time remaining, I need to push into bigger groups and I need to talk a little bit about the, the, the added structure. I've already started to dance around some of this. First, um, you'll notice I used a different wild card here than my asterisk. I used a five-pointed star here, 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 and then here I just used the ordinary asterisk. So this one, this wild card was um, following notation of who increased. This is the RO. C2 grading. So I actually have more information that I have at my fingertips. And second, I talked about an ideal here, which says that I should be thinking about this actually as a spectral sequence of rings. And that's true, but I won't go too much into it. Uh, so in fact, uh, the slice spectral sequence is a spectral sequence of uh, commutative monoids in Mackey functors. And these are called uh, green functors. Uh, Sean asks um, if there's a that there's a result saying differentials are power operations. Um, it, yes, yes. Um, the uh, maybe the the best way to say what the differentials are in the classical Atiyah Hirzebrook spectral sequence is that they're cohomology operations because they're maps connecting between uh, Eilenberg maclean spectra. And here in for for something like MUR, the, the fibers are, again, suspensions of eilenberg maclean spectra. So the initial differentials are exactly uh, cohomology operations, in this case, from cohomology with constant Z coefficients to itself. And then all of the higher differentials can be expressed as secondary or, or higher order operations just as we would see with the ordinary Atiyah Hirzebrook spectral sequence. Um, in this case, it's a, it's a consequence of knowing the form of the spectral sequence, knowing that the fibers are all these uh, generalized eilenberg maclean spectra. But yeah, I can think of them in exactly that way. Um, okay, so I'm, in the, the time remaining, and I've said that already, I want to do one last added bit of structure. So here I've used that the Mackey structure shows up and it gives me a way to produce a bunch of permanent cycles and to transport differentials. Then I know that this is a spectral sequence of these ring objects, these green functors. So I understand that at each page I have a ring and at, for each G mod H I have a ring. The restriction maps are all ring maps. And so I can use all of this to, to 
continue to bind classes to other classes and simplify the problem. The last part is to use the norm. So we have also multiplicative transfers. And these are actually arising from functors uh, quite generally on, on the complete spectra. So I have a, a norm functor from H spectra to G spectra. And this is a symmetric monoidal functor that's going to take some E, and you should think about it as going to, I'm going to smash together uh, G mod H copies of E i.e. this is a tensor induction. And these norm maps have the property that since the tensor product is the co-product on commutative rings, I have canonical maps. Uh, I have canonical. maps for any commutative ring in uh, G spectra. I have a map from the norm of the restriction of R back to R. This endows the homotopy Mackie functors of R with these external norm maps. And here I have to use the grading by the representation ring. Oops. So just as earlier, when I talked about the sum over the vial group, or the sum over G being the trace, I'm using the Galois theoretic language there. Here, I'm also using the Galois theoretic language. You should think of this as being, as being heuristically the product over, over G mod H of some element. And since my ring is commutative, if the group is acting by permuting now the tensor factors around, but the multiplication is actually commutative, so it doesn't care what order that they were in, this gives me a way to take an element that's fixed by H and produce an element that's fixed now by G. The, this structure was first studied by Tambara, who looked at these and called them TNR functors, these sort of Mackey functors together with multiplicative transfers. And the last result is the slice spectral sequence is a spectral sequence of uh, Tambara functors. This one, I don't know how to show this in, a, in the motivic context, the analogous operations, the analogous norms and normed motivic spectra were done by Bachman and Hoiwa. They described uh, how you can think about the norm maps and how to build these added norm, uh, external norm maps on commutative monoids in this context. And I would expect that the slice spectral sequence should have this property. In the equivariant context, the somewhat surprising feature is that the slice filtration is actually the universal filtration that has the property that it takes commutative monoids in spectra to a spectral sequence of, of uh, Tambara functors. Um, and if there are questions about that afterwards, I'll answer it. So I, I, I saw you pop in, Frederic, so I know that I'm, that I'm almost out of time. So let me just say a punchline. And that is, uh, what the hell does it mean to be a spectral sequence of Tambara functors? So it means that we have... So I was popping for questions, but you can, you can take time. Oh, okay. I, I reserve my question. All right. For us. 
So we have a twisted version of the Leibniz rule. And let me just spell that out in one case. So I have the, I need to just move this up. I have that the differential on some class that I'll write as the norm of x. Again, heuristically, so I'll do this in a different color because this part's a lie. This is supposed to be x times the conjugate of x. And then I know from the Leibniz rule how to compute the differential on a product. This is the differential on x times gamma x plus x times the differential on gamma x. Remember the differentials were maps of Mackey functors, so I can pull the vial action out. So this is dx times gamma x plus x times gamma of dx. And this is the same thing then as one plus gamma on x times, oops, not the one I wanted to do, dx times gamma x. And now I can make this true statement, which is the transfer of dx times gamma x. So this is the, the version of the Leibniz rule that shows up in this case. The differential on the norm, it's just like a, on a product, but I'm supposed to remember that the norm was a kind of product where the group permuted the factors around. And so the differential is going to take that to a sum where again, the, the group permutes now the sum ends around, and that's exactly the role of the transfer. You can do better though. This is saying something just about D of N of the norm. It's just the usual Leibniz property. And so this is the very last thing I'll say. And we can do better. If D N of X, so now I'm in my uh, slice spectral sequence, is Y then I actually get a longer differential, d 2n minus one of that same class from before, a sigma times the norm of x is the norm of y. For this, I don't know a classical antecedent. This is saying that instead, that once I put in this a sigma, it actually, the differential almost behaves like a ring map at the expense of shearing it from the dn to d2n minus one. So it's like saying, if I know the differential on x, then I can, is y, then there's some kind of differential on x squared that looks like some kind of y squared. And these, these collections of properties I've described them are the way that people are doing computations with these spectral sequences. So uh, I think I'll stop there. Uh, okay, so first, uh, Mike, thanks a lot for the, for the nice talk. And uh, so we, we are, uh, so let's fire the first question. So can you read it or do I read it? Yeah. So, uh, Sean asks, couldn't I view a sigma n and n as two different power operations? And then it would look like some of Bruner's work. Yeah, I think that's exactly the way that I want to do this. Um, they, it's, I, I should be able to connect a sigma n to some kind of, of actually in this case, um, Dyer-Lashoff operation, because I'm looking at an operation on homology. Um, but I don't, I, I don't quite know how to make those work. I'd love to talk to you more about that. Um, yes, they, uh, Sean also asked, do these norms prolong to the category of filtered equivariant spectra? Yes, they do. 
Um, uh, Yuri asks, is the universal property of the slice filtration written down anywhere? Uh, no. Um, at least I don't think, so. maybe, but I don't, I don't recall. Oh wait, maybe in the Handbook of Homotopy, in the chapter I wrote for the Handbook of Homotopy, I believe I talked about the universal property of the slice filtration. Uh, there, so thank you for uh, making me remember that. And then um, anonymous attendee asks, could I mention some of the applications to chromatic homotopy as promised in the abstract? Also, yes. Um, so the applications of some of this, and I'll be quick. Um, the applications are, first, let me recall a theorem of Han Shi. And this says that the Lubin Tate spectra EN for any N are real orientable. In other words, I have a map of ring objects in the homotopy category, MUR to EN. Knowing this, uh, if n is uh, two to the k minus one times anything, so times m, then the Hopkins-Miller theorem says that c two to the k acts on en, which gives me then uh, via uh, just the 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 norm forget a junction I described above, a map from C2 to C2 to the K of MUR into EN. That's again a map of ring objects, but now in the homotopy category of C2 to the K spectra. And then recent work of, of Baudry. Uh, me, uh, Ding Shi, and Ming Kong Zheng says that you can use this to build a model for E theory. E n as the K n localization. Of, weird, of some quotient of MUR and to spell out exactly what stuff is would take me a little far afield. But the important thing is the slice spectral sequence here has a describable, uh, a more understandable E2 and then et cetera terms, than the corresponding Lubin-Tate theory had. We knew the C2 action on EN but being able to describe the C2 to the N action on EN in a way that we could write down the homotopy fixed point spectral sequence, that was, that was sort of the, the bloody edge of the state of the art. Using these sorts of equivariant methods and stepping through the norms and these sort of quotients of the norms of MU, the slice E2 term is very easy to write down and to describe, and then you can use the techniques that I was describing over the course of the talk to sort of bootstrap differentials inducting up over the order of the group and use this to get a lot of information about the homotopy groups of, of the Hopkins-Miller spectra uh, in ways that we never were able to before. 
Okay, so so I have a question. Uh, what's the link between Tambara and green functors? You know, it's very. Um, uh, so there's a forgetful functor. Every Tambara functor has an underlying green functor. Mm -hmm. So a Tambara functor you can think of as a green functor together with these additional multiplicative norm maps. And then there's actually, just as there was a hierarchy that started with coefficient systems and it ended in Mackey functors, where I start to put in more and more transfers, there's a hierarchy between green functors, which are Tambara functors with no multiplicative transfers, all the way up to Tambara functors, which have all multiplicative transfers. And this hierarchy, I can, it's exactly analogous to the additive hierarchy for the Mackey functor case. And um, this, is, this is an important feature. So thank you for bringing it up. Um, Zariski localization does not work well in Tambara functors. So for equivariant commutative rings, Zariski localization doesn't preserve the property of being a commutative ring. It does always preserve the property, though, of being sort of the spectral version of a green functor. So a, a, an algebra over an E infinity operat. But it's, it's a very particular kind of E infinity operat, one in which the group doesn't act. And so that's a, a, a subtlety that shows up and makes some of the computations a little trickier. Okay, uh, so, and, and also I have a um, kind of maybe vague or broader question. So, so you describe my key functor and they are defined for finite groups, but yeah. is there a, a theory for other groups? So for first oh, yeah. example, it would be profinite groups like Galois yeah. groups. Yeah, um, yes. Um, and there are several, several uh, versions of these for the, um, the cases that were most studied in, in classical homotopy theory were compact Lie groups, where again, we have a good notion. And there, uh, and you have Mackey functors for a compact Lie group, and they're describing the homotopy groups of a, a genuine G spectrum for G compact Lie. Um, there, the multiplicative version of these only shows up for finite index, so pairs of finite index subgroups. There's no sort of degree shifting part that can show up in the, in the compact Lie. For profinite, um, Dress and Siebenacher have a, a Witt vector construction for, for sort of profinite groups that's generalizing the ordinary mm. Witt vectors. And they're describing the profinite version of the Burnside ring in that case, because the vid vectors, the vid vectors of Z is, is where the, the truncated vid vectors are exactly giving me the various Burnside rings as I look uh, for like C, N, or whatever my truncation system was. Um, Barwick also in his spectral Mackey functors has a really beautiful approach to understanding the profinite case of uh, our Mackey functors as well. Um, beyond this, you can nothing. Nothing that I was writing down really depended on on the group being finite. Um, I could still talk about finite G sets for G not finite. I start to run into pathologies like if G is divisible, there aren't any interesting finite G sets, um, and then I'm going to start to run into trouble. But aside from from those cases. Uh, you can talk then about, you can talk about Mackey functors, you can do all the same thing. Uh, last question, I was also thinking about, I don't know if you know these uh, uh, Ross cycle modules. So it looks really like uh, Mackey functors, but there are uh -huh. uh, two operations that are added. So it's kind of multiplication by, by unit and residue maps for valuations. Uh -huh. And it, it, it 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 made it could make uh, you, you we could see that as uh, Mackey functors for the so-called motivic Galois groups where you have transcendental uh -huh. extension. So it, it, have you seen something like that? In I guess. Um, in I I haven't, somewhere. but but that's a that's an interesting thing. I'll think about that. Um, okay. 
I think. I mean, one of the reasons that I wanted to. Question. Yeah, yeah. One of the reasons I wanted to give this talk is I think a lot of the techniques that we've been using in the recently in the equivariant context should port through without change into the motivic one. All the stuff that we've been seeing with the multiplicative transfers, anything showing up in the in the Bachman Hoy Wa mm. normed motivic spectra, we should have analogs of these two kinds of conditions on differentials in certain spectral sequences. And this last one, the one that changes degree, it's allowing you to lift differentials multiplicatively in a way that's, that can actually be pretty surprising uh, to get new ones. So I'd love to see the analog of that uh, motivically. Okay. So it seems we have no more questions. So again, Mike, thanks a lot for a nice talk.